Hello, operating systems people. This is Gabe, and today we are going to be talking about interprocess communication implementation. So how we actually go about optimizing for one of the most fundamental parts of our systems. So why do I say it's fundamental? Well, we've seen over the past, what, three weeks that we have looked at Unix with pipes. We've looked at modern Unices and implementations that include things like um, System D and DBus for communication and coordination. And we've gone through Plan 9, where we saw that kind of IPC, especially using 9P, is a fundamental structuring pattern for being able to provide abstract resources. And of course, we saw in capability-based operating systems that you have IPC provided by synchronous call gate and Locations. So IPC really is a foundation for composition within systems. That we see this again and again isn't an accident. It means that you can actually define abstract resources at user level in servers and then multiple clients can actually access those. So IPC is really important. We're going to dive into how you actually implement it efficiently. So first let's start with a little bit of a straw man but a important one because it basically is kind of pipes within Unix. And that is asynchronous IPC using a buffer for buffering the communication, for buffering the data. Let's use a simple API with send and receive. Of course, this might be write and read in Unix or in Plan 9. Um, and we take a channel as a first argument. You might think of that as just a generalization of a file descriptor or a capability. Um, a buffer that we want to send and then the size of the buffer that we want to send. And if we're sending it, great. If we're receiving it, then we're receiving into that buffer um, from the buffer in the kernel that holds the data. So the behavior here, the semantic behavior, is that the kernel buffer is of some fixed size, buff size, and send is non-blocking if and only if buffer the buffer in the kernel is not full. Receive is non-blocking if and only if the buffer is not empty, right? So <clears throat> if the buffer in the kernel is empty, then, you know, receive is going to essentially block. Now, of course, you might use non-blocking APIs and tell them not to block, but I'm going to ignore that just for simplicity. Um, and I am, as I said, kind of ignoring how we're getting CH. It would be different for different systems. So this is a very simple IPC pattern. It's asynchronous. We have separate threads for different processes. They're communicating via the pipe or whatever we want to call it. Um, and this is kind of what it ends up looking like. And it is optimizing a very around a very specific usage pattern. So let's talk about that. Okay. So if the sent amount, the amount that we're sending using the send system call is less than the buffer size, then the sender will continue executing um, and will be able to make additional system calls um, without needing to context switch. Only when the buffer fills up, for instance, will we actually need to context switch. So this means that we can make multiple system calls sending a lot of data um, before we actually need to block and context switch over to the other process that we're communicating with, right? Um, <clears throat> Now, this also assumes that the sender has more data to send. So it, it's not optimized around the case where we have a sender that wants to send something out on the pipe, on the channel, whatever, um, and then it has nothing more that it can do. For instance, because it needs to await some sort of response. So you can think in plan nine, this was very common, right? We would always write to some sort of a channel and then get a, uh, do a read back and the read would often be blocking. Um, so this is an assumption made for the optimization of the system. If instead we had to block after a single send, then we have to make two system calls for that, right? Okay, so this is a good optimization if system calls are relatively cheap and context switches are relatively expensive. And it just so happens that system calls aren't that cheap, but certainly context switches are relatively expensive. Um, we'll get into some kind of high level uh, numbers for that later. Um, and it's a good optimization effectively if the senders can produce a lot of data without feedback. So they don't need to await some sort of response, right? So let's dive into what this actually means in terms of overhead. So if we're sending or receiving, actually, um, we have, of course, a system call. For a proxy for that, you can think of a system call as around 100 cycles. We're copying data into and out of the buffer, which happens to reside usually in the kernel. 
Um, and you can kind of think of that as being around 2,000 cycles for every four kilobytes of data that we're copying. Um, and if the buffer's full, then we have blocking costs, right? So let's dive into those a little bit. So if we are blocking a thread, that ends up on something like Linux being about 100 to 500 cycles. Um, it can span all the way up to 1,000 based on a number of situations, but 100 to 500 is a decent proxy. It's a very large range just because different systems are going to have different overheads for a lot of lists. So what is it? what are we doing when we're blocking a thread? Well, we're adding a thread to a wait queue for the channel, for the buffer, or whatever. Um, we are removing it from the run queue because it's no longer runnable. We set its state to be blocked because, as I said, it's no longer runnable. And then we call the scheduler to decide the next thread to actually execute execute, right? Waking a block thread is kind of the opposite, right? So it has a corresponding cost. We're removing ourselves from the wait queue for some for, for the channel that we were blocking on. We're adding ourselves to the run queue because we want to be considered by the scheduler for future execution. We're setting our state to be running and we're calling the scheduler. So again, this kind of cost can vary greatly depending on the system. And whenever we run the scheduler in a blocking or waking case, we might end up context switching. And if we context switch, we need to save and restore the registers, which is usually between 20 and 50 cycles. Very, very quick, actually. Um, and we need to actually often switch between page tables. That is not so quick, right? Um, so that can be upwards of 150 and in some processors even 300 cycles. And I'm not going to go into indirect costs here. Indirect costs are things like the impact on caches of these operations. So for switching page tables on a system that does not have address space IDs, we're flushing the TLB, for instance. Um, even when we're copying data in the percent costs up above, that is indirect costs because that might flush or existing data from the cache, evict additional data from the cache, which has an additional overhead as we run later as we need to pull that data back. So there are passive or indirect costs as well that I'm not going to talk about much. So this is effectively kind of what we're talking about um, in terms of the overhead for these types of operations. Now, the problem becomes that if those assumptions around kind of what um, this asynchronous communication is optimized for um, are not true. And one of the most frequent cases where it's not true um, that, for instance, we're going to be able to send multiple times before we do a receive or before we block is in a synchronous behavior. So when we have a client that wants to communicate with a server, it has code that looks like this. We want to send some sort of a request to the server, and then we want to receive the response from the server. At that point, we'll probably block, switch over to the server. The server will will receive that request from the client, formulate some response, and then send it back to the client, right? So this kind of looks like a function call, right? We're kind of sending some data, calling a function, and then we're receiving, returning from the function, right? So this is synchronous. Only one of these threads is really executing at any point in time, um, at least semantically. <clears throat> So this is common. We've seen this, right? Plan 9 doesn't necessarily do have a um, 9p call for this, but it does do this a lot. We saw examples where we needed to write something to a file and then read from the file a corresponding answer, right? Um, so it might be nice to have some sort of uh, operation that we could perform that did that for us. Um, but a lot of these systems that are asynchronous do not. They have send and receive. So if we look at the overheads for this, we start to see that, you know, for the client, we have the send and receive. So that's two system calls, two times copying the data in and out. Um, we have a context switch over to the server. We have the client blocking. We have it later waking up. And we have the corresponding same uh, mirrored operations for the server. So if you look at all of that on Linux, it actually adds up to quite a bit. It adds up to about 4,500 cycles on Linux. This this is round about two microseconds, which means um, half a million of these operations can proceed per second, um, which sounds like a lot. A million is a, a large number, but if you look at that latency, it's actually relatively similar to modern networks. Networks are actually getting really fast. They're on the order of five microseconds. So it doesn't feel right that kind of IPC on a system is on the same order of magnitude of overhead as networks, right? Um, so, you know what, let's that, that's, that's, that's dive in, right? Let's see if we can solve this problem. Let's see if we can get systems fast, right? So 
Let's instead look at trying to provide synchronous IPC as a fundamental primitive, not one built on top of asynchronous interactions. Let's think of it as synchronous. Um, okay, let's still keep multiple threads in the system. The server has a thread, the client has a thread, and they're going to communicate or rendezvous um, synchronously. And let's optimize the heck out of it, right? Um, Leek in 1993 provided a paper where he kind of revolutionized the way that we think about optimizing this stuff. So we're going to talk about four different steps. One, a better API for kind of a call and return style um, function invocation, right? But of course, one that happens between threads, between a client and server thread. We're going to talk about how to get rid of scheduler overheads. We're going to also talk about how to get rid of some of the data passing overheads, at least from the kernel's perspective. And we're going to talk about effectively optimizing around a fast path. So first, Let's talk about a better API. So we saw that send and receive, we had two system calls for every kind of back and forth, right? So in the client, we had to send and then receive. That's two system calls in the client. In the server, we had to receive and then send. That's two additional system calls in the server. Four system calls in total, that's a lot. It, it seems like we should be able to just replace those with two system calls, and indeed we can. So you see here, call is effectively a client essentially saying that it wants to call a function in another thread, right? Now I say that very um, stylistically, right? Of course it's not calling a function, um, but you kind of want the same synchronous behavior. The current function stops executing, waiting for that other function in the other thread to come to complete, you get a return value and then you resume, right? So call takes, of course, the channel or the capability, you pass a request and you pass the buffer that you want to get a response in. So this is your kind of arguments and your return value in the request and response. The server has a corresponding operation called reply and wait that will return or reply to a client and then block waiting for the next client request. So if we look at the code, you can see in the yellow, we have our client. It essentially does the call and then it will pass, you know, pass a request, which is effectively the arguments to the function. And then it wakes up once it gets a response. So it can process a response immediately after. In the green, we have the server, in which case we need to do one receive, one of those receives that we kind of talked about before, um, which you'll kind of see if you go through the structure of the code a little bit. So we get the first request, we process that request, and and then we reply to that client that was uh, making that request. And then we wait for the next client to make a request. And then we just do this infinitely. We keep waiting for the next client to make a request, get its request, formulate a response, reply that response to the client, and await the next client, right? So you can see in this API that we have synchronous behavior built in. The client blocks awaiting a reply while the server blocks waiting till the next client request comes in. So they essentially act in lockstep, right? The client executes until it makes a request, wakes up the server, the server executes, um, generates a, a, a response, replies and at that point will block and the client then wakes up and resumes execution. So this kind of, it, it's synchronous. It looks like a function call, right? Um, so this completely avoids those extra system calls for send and receive. And we'll see later it has another really cool effect. Okay. <clears throat> Second thing that we want to do is remove the scheduler overheads, avoid them. So Given the example I just gave that we're only executing one of these, a client or the server at any point in time because of the synchronous nature of them, um, we can see that we can start doing weird optimizations with the client wishes to, for the server to process its request. So why not just actually execute the server directly without even calling the scheduler? So when the client makes a call and says, hey, can you formulate, can you do some com computation for me, please, server? Then we could actually just switch directly to the server and let it compute, right? So if we just switch directly to the server without actually modifying the run queues or anything like that, then we are able to avoid all of the run queue manipulations, avoid all of the scheduling overhead, and... Um, 
essentially leave kind of the data structures in a weird state, right? If the client doesn't remove themselves from the run queue when the server is running, well, the server, I mean, sorry, the scheduler will think that it's running, but it's not, right? It's blocked waiting for the server, right? So we have some weird things happening. When the server wakes up and executes, if we don't modify it to put it into the run queue, then you know, how's the scheduler going to know that it's runnable? So what happens is that when an interrupt comes in, so for instance, when a timer interrupt comes in, then the system can say, ooh, okay, I got a timer interrupt. I think that the server is currently running. Ooh, but the server is executing for that client. I need to fix them up and make sure that the client gets off of the run queue and the server goes on to the run queue. So we can essentially add some overhead to that timer interrupt to actually fix up that state. Um, so what this essentially results in is that we have direct context switches. We don't need to call a scheduler at all simply because um, we are doing a direct switch between the two from the client to the server, viewing essentially the server as an extension of the client's execution. <clears throat> okay, and then on... Um, the other hand, when we look at data movement, so we, we, we start observing that we have an interesting kind of um, uh, structure between the client and the server. The synchronous IPC means that only one of the threads is executing at any point in time when they're kind of, you know, the, the client is calling and blocking while the server is executing and then they invert, right? Um, so that's interesting that because only one of them is executing at any point in time, this means that we can actually copy the buffer directly from the client into the server because only one of them is executing at any point in time. We don't need in kernel buffers. Um, and indeed, even later systems kind of said, well, you know what, let's just not really do the copying in the kernel at all. Instead, let's essentially take the register set that the client has that includes all the arguments that we're trying to pass over to the server and somehow make sure that all of that, that register set gets passed to the server, but not necessarily a big buffer. If the user wants to share a big buffer or a lot of data, then use shared memory for that, right? Set up shared memory between the client and server. So this is great. This means that one, we no longer need to have the buffers in the server, um, um, but it, and it also simplifies the path. So now the kernel is exceedingly fast. It doesn't need to do any of that copying except for the register set. Okay. Now, just like asynchronous IPC, where it was kind of optimized around the specific case where we weren't doing synchronous interactions um, and we could make many sends um, before we actually did a context switch, this IPC mechanism is very optimized around a fast path. And that fast path only really applies, and you really use a lot of these optimizations only in the case when the server is blocked awaiting a call from the client and the client is doing a call. So this is the case when we can start doing all of these optimizations that I just talked about. If, however, a server is not blocked on a receive and wait, it's not awaiting a new client request, for instance, because it's processing a previous client request, then a lot of this gets more complicated. We, then we need to invoke the scheduler, then we need to do all of these other operations. So this is really a fast path designed around that specific case where the server is waiting for the client, uh, blocked waiting for the client, and the client hands off control to it immediately. Um, so there are assumptions that this very much makes. Um, it kind of makes the assumption that server computation is fast, right? If we want to optimize the chance that the fast path is taken for IPC, then server computation better be fast because if the server is preempted and we switch to another thread, then that other thread, if it wishes to communicate with the server, well, the server was preempted. It's not blocked waiting for a client. So therefore, we don't have the fast path, right? The server is not awaiting that client's computation. Um, so the server computation tends to need to be fast, and we don't want servers to block. Because again, if a server blocks not waiting for a call in wait, not on a reply in wait, um, 
sorry, not awaiting a call from a client on a reply and wait, um, you know, we're, then you aren't going to use the fast path. So if you want to use all of these optimizations, you need to be really careful about how you write your servers, unfortunately. Um, the slow path that deals with a lot of these other concerns is still relatively fast, but it's usually, you know, it's within 1.5 or 2x um, overhead of the fast path. Okay, so if we look at the impact of all of this, and we replace send and receive with call from the client, and on the server we reply or we replace a receive and a send with a reply and wait, then on the right you can see we're getting rid of the copying of data. Instead, we're just passing it in registers. We're getting rid of one of the system calls. We only have the one call or the one uh, reply and wait, and we're getting rid of all of the blocking and waking overheads in that fast path. So we're just left with context switch, one system call, and the copying of a register set. So if we look at the impact of that, you can see that modern L4 variants, for instance, have about 900 cycles for that kind of two-way um, uh, uh, client making a request, server doing computation, returning back to the client. So that round trip overhead on um, L4 variants is about 900 cycles. So that is about a third of a microsecond, which means you can do about 3 million of these per second. So this is actually more so on the overhead of system calls than on kind of like network communication. So this is where you really want to be, right? You want to be comparable in some way to system calls if you're providing kind of these abstract resources. Because we're used to needing to access resources by invoking Linux, i.e. making a system call. So you want those to be more so on that. So this is about five times faster than Linux, as you can see, by basically going through a ton of optimizations. So, you know, we're done, right? That was awesome. You know, fantastic. We're done. We're the masters of all of the IPC. Um, we get all of the badges. We participated like the best of them. We get gold stars. We're good to go, right? Um, lecture over. You get to go off and play video games. Well, as you might expect. Not so much, unfortunately. Wow, and it's actually not cool. Penny crashed the ability to switch slides. Good girl. Wow, okay, that was awesome. Um, okay, so of course nothing's that nice, right? <clears throat> Um, she was a good girl. I want to be very clear about that. All of those, that complaint that I just implied, she's a good girl. Let it be said for the record. Okay. Um, everything's not quite dandy when we start looking at all of the edge cases. So, for instance, if a timer interrupt occurs during the server's execution, right? Server is executing on response to, on, uh, uh, on the behalf of a client that did a call. The server woke up from a reply and wait is um, computing for the client, whatever function they wanted it to, right? Okay. Do we update the priority of that server thread? What priority should the server thread run at? It's not clear. Um, do we use a priority of the client or do we use a priority of the server? Um, which thread do we actually charge for the execution in the server? It's natural, of course, to want to charge the server, but if we didn't kind of track when we switched from the client to the server, that becomes a little difficult, right? So who do we actually charge for this execution? These three questions essentially take us down a massive and adorable, I might say, rabbit hole that not everybody is a deep fan of. Um, this is where a lot of the complexity in kind of these synchronous IPC implementations actually start appearing. So let's dive into these one at a time. Which priority should we actually execute with? So let's assume that we have a client C um, and we're going to use its priority for execution within the server. Keep in mind, we are talking about switching between two separate threads for our IPC. So that typically means that you are going to need to have a, a scheduler in the kernel. So all of the L4 variants, which are microkernels, um, do have a scheduler within the kernel. <clears throat> so let's choose the policy where we're going to use C's, the client's priority, while executing in the server. Okay, 
Um, what if um, some other client, CH, here H denotes high priority, so higher, for instance, than the client um, who we're executing in the server on behalf of. So what if that high priority client, CH, does a call to the server, it blocks because, of course, the server is doing computation for C at this current point, and now CH is effectively beholden, it needs to wait for the server to finish its execution, right? But at that point, a middle priority thread, CM, M for middle priority, so it's that middle priority between C and H, um, between C's priority and C sub H's priority. Um, now a middle priority client essentially goes into an infinite loop. Right, so that that client is at a middle priority, which means it's a higher priority than C, and the server is executing using C's priority. So C sub M is at a higher priority than the server currently. So C M will always be chosen for execution in that case, right? <clears throat> okay, but the problem here is that C H is waiting for the server to compute to finish so that it can be serviced. So effectively, CM is delaying indefinitely the execution of CH. A middle priority thread is delaying indefinitely the computation of a high priority thread. This is what's called a classic priority inversion problem, and we see it here uh, manifesting in the synchronous IPC. Okay, so that's not great. So the answer must be the other thing, right? Which priority do we execute the server with? Cool, let's just use the server's priority, not the client's, right? We saw the client's gets messy. Okay, well, if the server's priority is less than the client's, then we kind of have exactly the same problem, right? If um, the client now blocks waiting for the server, the server executes at a lower priority, then some middle priority task between the client and the server executes and delays the execution of the server indefinitely, therefore delaying our client, which has a higher priority than it. So again, we have priority inversion. So that doesn't really make sense. So what you typically want to do is what's called the priority ceiling protocol, which is to say that the server has a higher priority than all of the clients um, that could potentially invoke that server. Um, now, the weird thing is, this, this is a decent solution, but the weird thing is that a client at a very low priority can ask for service from that high priority server and delay the execution of other tasks in the system because we're executing that server at a very, very high priority. While that server is executing, it's essentially delaying any of the clients that could potentially call it. So a very low priority client might use this to delay the execution of a lot of other tasks by the length of a server execution. So this is maybe also not the most awesome. Okay, now let's answer that second question. Um, who do we account the execution to? Who do we charge for the execution in the server, right? On the one hand, we could account the execution to the client. After all, we're executing in the server because the client is asking the server to execute. So maybe it makes sense to actually charge the client, right? Um, but what if that client's budget runs out in the middle of the server's execution? Oof. So now a client can prevent a server's execution by setting up its budget um, maliciously so that it will be expended while executing in the server. And then if another client wants to use the server, well, the server's blocked because it was using that client's budget. So that is real, real bad, right? So it's not clear that there's a good solution to this without going into a lot of complexity. <clears throat> On the other hand, um, that didn't really work out very well, so let's choose the opposite, right? Um, let's instead say that we want the account to account execution to the server, not to the client. Well, now we have a denial of service attack because a client can continuously ask for service from the server, therefore expending that server's budget for its execution, right? 
the scheduler will say, ooh, you're executing a lot, you're executing too much. And after, C makes many, many requests to the server that server's budget essentially gets used up. So the scheduler will not run, want to run it anymore for some amount of time. And if at exactly that point, some important client tries to ask S for service, we're now delaying that important client from actually providing, getting some sort of a reply from that server for a very long time until his budget replenishes somehow, right? So we kind of have a tax on both sides that you could see happening in the system. Um, so it's really, really hard to get this to work and it demands additional mechanisms. So I'm going to go into one of them, but first I want to kind of back up to the absolute highest level and kind of point out what we've been talking about here, right? So when we said, okay, whose priority do you use? Who do you account to? Who do you charge for the execution? We're essentially saying that if we have a thread that wants to ask a, a client, that wants to ask a server for service, maybe that server asks another server for service, maybe that server asks another server for service, et cetera, et cetera. As we build this chain of these dependencies, can we actually say how long it's going to take for our client to execute? Do we have what's called end-to-end -end predictability within the system, right? So if we create these functional dependencies between tasks, a client on a server, that server on another server, et cetera, et cetera, um, and that's multiple protection domains that in, in essence need to trust each other, can we impact the non-functional constraints? So non-functional constraints here is the predictability, right? So can we actually generate a system that actually behaves in a predictable way? We can say how long it takes a client to actually get a reply. This is obviously important for systems that take time very seriously, like IoT or real-time systems, but also just very important when you start thinking about the security of the system, as we already pointed out as when we come up with denial of service attacks and whatnot. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look at an example of a system that actually tries to solve this in a very interesting and decent way. So Fiasco L4 and Nova um, have variants on a system called Credo. They're different. I'm going to conflate those differences now. Um, you will be looking through the IPC code of Nova relatively soon. Um, so what they do is they make the observation that we can decouple what they call the scheduling context from the execution context. The execution context of a thread is, you know, it's C execution stack, um, the thread that we track in the kernel, the register contents, all of that stuff. The execute, the scheduling content, sorry, is things like the priority and the budget. And we might be able to move the priority and the budget around throughout the system. Um, even if our execution context, our threads stay within our clients or our servers, right? So what you see on the right is four different protection domains. Think of them as components. We have four different threads, um, one that executes at um, the priority of client zero, one that executes at the priority of client one. Um, we have a server that has a certain priority associated with it, and we have a server prime that has another priority. And you can see that they're all connected via kind of these um, call gates that can be used to kind of communicate between them. And as a thread is executing, you have the teal on the right, which is effectively the priority of that client and the budget associated with that client. As that thread invokes the server, you can see who is active because of the, the boldness of the thread. So we can see that we've done a call operation, the reply and wait in the server returns, and we're starting to actually do the computation in the server in response to the client's request. And that server might invoke the other server, and everything goes on normally. Once we get a timer tick low, what Credo does is it essentially at that point says, okay, I know that I have a prior, uh, some sort of an interrupt. I need to figure out what priority this certain thread is running at. I need to figure out what budget to account to. And it will actually take that highest priority thread in the system and just kind of track through the IPC data structures between the clients and the servers to figure out how to get to the currently executing server. 
So we know that we can associate the uh, priority of C1 with the current execution, and we can also use that budget. But if at that point in time, we have another thread that comes into the system. So in this case, it's a high priority thread. And because it's a high priority thread, it can preempt that lower priority execution. So PCH is higher than PCL, right? So we start executing that high priority thread, again, as you can see by it being bold in the top left. And now it makes an invocation to the shared server. But because that shared server is already doing computation for the other client, it needs to block, denoted by the X. Now, the question is, which budget should we continue executing in the server with, and which priority should we continue executing with in that server? So what we always do is we kind of say, okay, I can look at the, the client that was executing and just always track its budget. So we're always using the budget of the client that in the end made the, the kind of the, the request to the, the first server. However, to avoid priority inversion, we actually have to use the highest priority of any of the threads that are either um, that are clients of any of these servers. So you can see the yellow line where we're actually taking the priority from the high priority thread. So this is effectively priority and budget inheritance, where we're taking the highest priority of all of the threads blocked on any of these servers that are interacting, and the budget of the current client that is effectively um, the one that all these servers are actually doing computation for, right? Okay, so the benefits of this is that we can still use that notion of lazy scheduling that I talked about before. Lazy scheduling meaning we don't need to call a scheduler on the fast path of IPC. Therefore, it still is very efficient. It has all of those optimizations that I talked about. Um, we're always using the priority of the maximum priority of any of the threads kind of along the path, the IPC path, and we're using the budget of the actual client. The downsides of this is, effect is unfortunately that we have an O of N cost when we're tracking down this um, priority. So an O of N cost in these types of kernels can be bad because often they're non-preemptive, which means we're delaying interrupts while that O of N cost is proceeding. So some systems might find this completely um, impossible, simply because that O of N cost might delay interrupts for too long. It also is placing a lot of policy in the kernel. All this notion of whose priority we're taking, whose budget we're taking, how we track it all, that's all now policy baked into the kernel that we have to live with, right? You can't design around that, right? <clears throat> and we still have the problem that I pointed out before, whereby if we run out of budget in the server, we're re executing using the client's budget. We need to figure out what to do right? Okay. So I want to back up quite a bit and I want to actually describe kind of these synchronous IPC mechanisms along a spectrum. I started out today talking about synchronous rendezvous between threads, synchronous IPC between threads, and we're going to end up talking about something that we've already talked about before in the class, which is thread migration. If we look at a lot of the systems that have existed along the spectrum, we see the original L4, which I talked about the optimizations for at the start. We saw um, Nova and Fiasco, which is kind of the credo work, which is very similar to what I described previously, that are moving more towards thread migration. What I mean by that is effectively this notion of decoupling the execution context from the scheduling context means that some of the thread migrates with the IPC, in this case the budget, right? And the priority somehow needs to be considered there. Composite, however, of course, uses complete thread migration. It doesn't use any of that stuff. It just says, yeah, there, there's no switching of threads going on when we do IPC. Right, so that is migrating between. Now, on the left, a lot of systems have used this notion of leak gazelle for uh, uh, optimizations. Again, that was a 1993 paper, so it's been around for a very long time. 
Um, so it's it's demonstrated, right? It's a known technology. We know it's fast. Um, a lot of systems are using it, so um, there's a certain certainty to kind of what's comfortable. On the right, with thread migration, we actually have policy independence. We no longer need the scheduling in the kernel. We don't need to define all these policies for things like who gets what priority and who is accounted to um, in the kernel. Instead, all that goes up into the um, user level. But as a big downside that, as we'll see, servers need to be concurrent. They need to be multi-threaded. Okay, so I'm going to focus for the rest of this on thread migration. We've already talked about it, so I'm going to go through it pretty quick. Um, thread migration is essentially the idea that we have multiple components. We have a thread executing in a client, and if it wants to exercise a call gate, it wants to invoke another component, then it can do so. But we don't switch between threads. In essence, somehow that same thread feels like it's executing between the different components. But of course, to maintain protection within the system, to maintain specifically um, execution and memory protection, we need to make sure that the components can't mess with each other. They can't kind of um, mess up each other's memory. So we need to make sure that we have separate stacks in each of the threads. We need to make sure that when we switch between the components, we're saving and restoring registers properly. Um, and we need to make sure essentially that you have disjoint sets of memory that they have access to. Um, what this does mean is that if we have multiple client threads and they want to invoke a shared server, we might need to have multiple of these stacks allocated within one of the servers. And if we have multiple of these stacks allocated within a server, we need to have some way of deciding how many stacks, which thread gets which stack to execute in, when it invokes a server, etc. Um, I'm not going to go into the details there, but suffice it to say all of that code and all that policy is up in the component, not in the kernel. And we have to answer the question of how do we actually do scheduling in the system. And you all have been paying attention so far, so you understand that scheduling in composite with thread migration is done in a component. So we can define the scheduler up in one of the components. So it is the one that actually defines the priority PC for that thread. Um, nothing else, right? The kernel doesn't really know about um, the semantics behind priorities at all. And now the scheduler operates by dispatching between threads, which means that if you have two threads in the system and you want to switch from one that is, for instance, blocking itself, it's calling some sort of a uh, interface that says block, um, the scheduler can actually execute its own code, decide which thread to run next, maintain its own run queue, blocked queues, all of that stuff. And if it decides that it wants to run this other thread, it simply invokes a thread capability to actually dispatch to it, to switch to it, right? In that case, the kernel can be involved, but we have ways to get around that in some cases. So what this means is that because the scheduler is just raw dispatching between threads, it can track its own budget and priority for each of the threads and define its own policies for how to actually define those. <clears throat> now, of course, we need some way to handle timer ticks, and that's simple. Um, we've seen that there's a way that a scheduler thread can receive notifications from the kernel, and timer ticks are one of those, so it can receive um, notifications about the passage of time. We also need some way to allow threads to activate based on um, asynchronous um, activations from things like interrupts from, for instance, a networking interface card. And we saw that asynchronous activation endpoints allow us to do this, and we can activate a thread directly from an interrupt um, by doing so. And we haven't seen it yet, but I want to mention it, that we can actually have multiple schedulers in the system. And the way that they interact is through a very careful system called temporal capabilities. So how do you interact between things that need to share resources? Well, you do it through the capability system. Temporal capabilities are just a access control mechanism for time itself. So schedulers can interact using TCAPs. Now, there are a lot of downsides to lists, or perceived downsides. One of them is that user-level scheduling seems to be slow, right? We need to now, instead of executing a scheduler in the kernel, be executing it at user level. So that, of course, seems slow. But we've really optimized this very far to the point where it's about 41 cycles. If you want to read about that, there's a pretty cool paper about that. <clears throat> 
Um, but then you also kind of might make the observation that instead of what you were doing before, where if you wanted to like block a thread, you could just call down to the kernel to ask the kernel to block you. Well, you can't do that anymore. You need to invoke the scheduler. So you need to use IPC to ask the scheduler to block you. Um, now, there are overheads to this. I don't want to say that there aren't, but because of the simplicity of thread migration, invocations between different components in composite using thread migrations are significantly faster than even kind of the fastest L4 variants. So you can see they're up to about 20% faster using thread migration. So it's not um, free, certainly, to call to the scheduler to ask it to do operations, but um, it's also not um, that much. And if we compare it to the actual cost for switching between threads in Linux, it's more than twice faster. Um, so there are downsides, but through kind of optimized system design, you might be able to get around a lot of those. Okay, so let's go through these downsides one by one. Um, one, it's concurrency by default. Every server needs to assume that each thread can um, invoke it using thread migration at any point in time, right? Assuming that they have, of course, a synchronous call gate to, let, to the server. So this means that you need to be able to handle multiple threads executing in each server at any point in time. So each server needs to be written in a way that is multi-thread safe. That can be done really simply if you just kind of wrap a lock around the entire component, right? Then it's very similar to a server just being represented by a single thread. Um, but there are some overheads for that. So um, that also means that we need to have predictable locks. I'm not gonna go into what this means, but a lot of those questions about what priorities should we use, we need to answer those still, but they're, they're defined at user level now. Um, because if you have some shared data structure in a server and you have contention on the lock, you need to decide what priority to actually execute a thread with. There are known techniques for dealing with things like priority inheritance protocol or priority ceiling. Um, but there are also more intelligent things that you can do to actually avoid needing locks at all, which is what we do by default. Um, <clears throat> And as I said, blocking APIs require IPC to the scheduler. So there is some overhead for doing that over uh, theoretical systems. However, like I said, um, switching between threads and systems is significantly faster than it is in Linux. So um, it's probably fast enough, right? It's not super fast, but it is fast enough. So what have we gone over? We've gone over a lot of the gory details of IPC implementation and optimization and a lot of the trade-offs therein. Um, IPC is a fundamental mechanism for composition in systems. Um, as we've seen, it is hard in a way that you might not have expected. There are a lot of edge cases, but getting it fast and making it into a fundamental principle that can be used to compose systems, allow abstractions to be defined by different modules, et cetera, et cetera, and allow them to be composed. Um, but it is possible, right? Um, a lot of the complexity in implementing IPC is really comes from this notion of the edge cases, right? What happens if there's a preemption at some point in time? And the observation of thread migration is effectively that simplicity pays off, right? Removing the scheduling from the kernel means we don't really need to worry about much of that, and you can implement whatever policy you want at user level, right? Um, and eliminating blocking semantics from the kernel entirely because scheduling is now at user level means that we don't need to answer those questions about resource sharing. What if there are multiple threads that want to invoke a single server thread? So hopefully this has been interesting and useful as a deep dive into IPC, which is one of the fundamental compositional mediums of modern systems. Thank you all. Hope you're doing well.